Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are in topic number two. We're on page nine of your curriculum. So if you have your curriculum, please make sure you go ahead and open it up. If you do not have a curriculum yet, you can go online to our store where you can purchase a curriculum on our website. You'll get an automatic download link and you'll be able to download your curriculum there. Now, we're going to go through this. This is quite a long lesson. There's seven pages, so we're going to do this a little quickly. But we're going to talk about God's gifts, the things that God has given unto his people when it comes to divine purpose. Now, God's gifts are not just positions in the body, but equipping in the spiritual gifts and different things. So when we get to some of these, you know, we're not going to explain every one of the spiritual gifts. You know, we're not going to unpack all of the fivefold in extensive detail. We have that in our BSM discipleship curriculum if you want more information on that. But we're really just going to go over all of the different gifts that God gives and ways to operate in the things of God. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown. Producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to jump right into this lesson because, like I said, it's a, it's a pretty long lesson, so we're not going to have really inter any introduction today. So let's just get right into it. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So what two things are without repentance and why is this important? Repentance means God takes it back. Well, the first part is gifts. The second part is callings. So everything that God has ever given to you, salvation, spiritual gifts, power, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, will never be taken back. It can only be given up or not walked in, which means if God gave you something, you could throw it away, You know, like your salvation. God give you, you get born again. You can denounce God and give up your salvation, or you can just not use it, meaning God gives you something like a, like the spiritual gifts, and then you just never use them. You know, God gives you the word of knowledge, yet you never speak. Well, it's given to you, but you don't use it, which means God didn't take it away from you, which means you no longer have the gift. You still have it, whether you use it or not. If you have ever failed or walked away, God has a plan to restore you if you turn back. Now, when I backslid from the Lord for five years, most of you know my testimony. I walked with the Lord diligently for three years. I was called to the ministry. I pastored in a church and then I got a divorce and I walked away from the Lord for five years. When I walked away from the Lord, a amazing man of God called me. Still to this day, one of the most amazing people in my life and said, Cody, the gifts of God are without repentance. And when he said that, he was trying to enforce in my life that the Holy Ghost would never be taken away, so that no matter how far I walked away from the Lord, I would always know that I could come back because I had that gift on the inside of me. And it was, a, it was one of the most foundational verses anybody ever spoke in my life because it's what actually kept me from denouncing the Lord because I knew I always had the Holy Ghost. And though I never read my Bible, really, maybe once or twice, I really never prayed. I never sought the Lord. I wasn't going to church. I always prayed in tongues because I knew I still had a gift. And I knew there was still power behind the gift, whether I was really walking with God or not. But it's not just the gifts are without repentance, the callings, which means if God speaks something over your life and you fail like I did and walked away, my calling, not only to pastor, but my calling for Chicago was never taken away from me. God still had that over my life. And you know what happened when I came back and God restored me? He made my calling sure, and I have actually walked in that for over two years now. So that's a powerful thing to remember. It's not just gifts, it's callings. So everything God ever gives you or speaks over your life, he never takes away. So if God says that you're a pastor when you're in your 20s and you look up in your 40s, you've never pastored, because you've just done whatever you want to do and you haven't walked with the Lord, if you wanted to come back and really walk in your purpose, God can still restore you and redeem you in that. Some powerful truths to that. We encourage you not to walk away from the Lord, but if you have, there is redemption. Now, 
Let's get into what these things are, these gifts and these callings and these different things. Let's talk about it. Ephesians 4, this is where we're going to talk about the fivefold. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Which, this is the answer to this first question. How much grace? 100%. The measure of the gift of Christ. was How, how much was the gift of Christ? 100%. So you have 100% of the measure of grace. You know, you already have all of it. That's, I mean, we say that all the time, but just to make sure you know, there is nothing lacking in your life. Period. Wherefore he saith, he sent it up on high and let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So there are gifts. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he that ascended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the thing that also ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now that's a parenthetical, it's a parenthesis. Just remember that. That's just giving explanation. So when it says he ascended, he led, he gave, it's because of what he did through redemption on the cross. He gave and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's all in love. Never forget that. It's not in covetedness and pride and position. It's love that drives. It's the driving motive of our life. What are the five folds? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Are they titles? Let's go ahead and we're going to drive this point home. The five fold are not titles. They're positions. They're ministries. This is important. There's a lot of people that say, well, I am prophet so-and-so. I'm evangelist. No, you're not. Stop. I, I, I'm, I'm, this, is, this, is a, this is a very serious point right here. I'm no joking. All joking aside, there is no, I'm not joking. There is no title in the Bible. You are a son of God. You are the bride of Christ, and you are a servant unto the Lord Jesus. You are not using these as titles. They're positions. They're ministries. They're offices. They are jobs in the body. They are used for purposes. They are not to be used as titles to try to declare yourself to be somebody. As Dr. Summerall said, Banana tree does not have to shout. It's a banana tree. It just has to produce bananas. That is one of my favorite phrases anybody's ever said, because it's important to remember people try to use what God gives them as a way to exalt themselves. You're full of pride and you're full of the devil. It's not what it's for. There's a reason why on churches it says, like on our church it says Pastor Cody Dyer. And I tell people, you don't have to call me that. You know, it's not a it's not a title. I hold a position in our church as the shepherd of the flock. It's it's not a title. Like when I go to I went to a a pastor's event one night. People were introducing themselves and I was at and this one guy, me and him shook hands, and we introduced and he says, "You know, what's your I was like, I'm, you know, my name's Cody." He goes, "Do you do you want me to call you pastor?" I said, "No. You can just call me brother Cody, brother Dyer. Just you can call me Cody if you want to. Like, you don't have to You, I, I don't believe in titles. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's good because he didn't either. You know, he, he's like, I don't even like doing that. I was like, well, me too. You know, I, I believe in offices because you ready? They're meant to equip the body, meaning to strengthen you, to the work of the ministry, meaning that there's things that need to get done in the church and things like that. And to grow the church into the fullness of their purpose, to look like Jesus, me measuring the stature of the fullness of Christ. The five-fold ministry is not being about being better than you or being above you. 
The fivefold ministry is actually about serving you. It's placing you above me. You know, people have this wrong perception of pastoring or doing the work of the ministry, and then they get in the church and realize this is a whole lot of servitude, but not a whole lot of reward, because your reward's mostly in heaven. And it gets really hard and people quit because they have a wrong perception. You know, they think being a pastor of a church is all about everybody acknowledging you and you being somebody. That's not what it's about. Not about me being somebody. It's about I have a responsibility unto the Lord to take care of you. And that's what my position is for. It's to protect you from the lies of the devil, to not let you be carried about with all these different random doctrines and things, and to grow you up into looking like Christ. That's what I have been called to do. That's my purpose in life. It's to shepherd this flock and then to preach the gospel across the world. So that is a work. It's an office that I have to use. It's the ministry in which I serve others. People think being a pastor, you know, people serve you and people acknowledge you and you have some type of status. No. And if that's how you are treating what God gives you and your purpose and your calling and your gifting, then you're wrong. And you're full of the devil. You're full of pride. It's not about you. It's about the other person. I want you to know that doing the work of the ministry is not really always easy. A lot of times, not easy at all. There's very little acknowledgement. Sometimes there's very few people that uh, appreciate what you're doing. And a lot of times it's a whole lot of service with mostly no reward. Because your reward, like I said, is in heaven. And people have this wrong understanding when they look at churches small churches or even the big churches man if i could just be a pastor like that then it would be great well maybe not it's not about being somebody or having some title or being acknowledged by other people it's about serving the flock that god puts you over so never misunderstand the five-fold ministry is about service growing you up protecting you doing work it's not some title it's just it's just a position that i have to do it's a role that needs to be fulfilled so god places me in this ministry and says i want you to do this work so that's why i do it you ready whether we're acknowledged or not it's not about being acknowledged it's about serving god faithfully and doing the work of the ministry faithfully and serving the people of god can't say that enough times people come to me and say well, I'm prophet so-and-so. Okay, are you serving people? Or are you using that word as a title so people will acknowledge you? Have you got how strong I feel about this now? Now, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, help, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, all works of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. What are the ministries or offices listed here? Apostles, prophets, teachers, workers of miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongue. Now, how are they different than the fivefold? We see that there are more gifts of God operating in the church than just the fivefold. So many times we prophets are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's who God gave. Here we see very clearly there's even more gifts. So even though you might not have a full-time ministry position, meaning that this is what you do as your occupation, or this is what you do full-time, there is still purposes and calls of God there are still gifts of God that are in the church. There are people in the church that have gifts of help that I'm not as equipped as they are to do. They just have a natural inclination to do things for people in a way that's not natural. It's not my gifting. You know, they are, though I could do it, it would be a strong challenge because it's not me. It's it's not just, it's not how I'm made. But for them, it is so natural. They could do it all day, every day, smile the entire time, even if nobody recognizes them for it. It's just, that's their gift. And that's good. 
and it's all needed. And we give honor not only to the people that are in full-time ministry, but we give honor to the people that serve the Lord faithfully, even in areas in which it's not full-time. You know, because there are so many other things in the church other than just the pastor on the stage or the evangelist in the meeting or the, you know, the apostle that's playing. There are more people in the church that are doing things other than just the, the main people that do it as full-time occupation. Now, this is an important point. There is a full-time occupation that is needed because there is a lot of time that it takes to do that type of work. To be able to start and to plan a church, to run your website, to preach on the pulpit, to do the counseling, to, I mean, all of the things that it takes to do the actual understanding of the fivefold, that's a full time. I spent eight hours outlining one chapter of the Bible, and that was just one day. It doesn't take into account the other days that I've studied and meditated and prayed. I mean, there is certain chapters of the Bible I have hundreds, maybe thousands of hours of studying in to be able to teach. If you worked a full time, eight hours a day job, you wouldn't have the time to study the amount that I have to do to be able to bring you the revelation that God is teaching me. So there's a reason why the fivefold is full time occupation. But there's also other gifts people that help stack the chairs, serve the food, cook. I mean, all, you know, drive the bus to pick up people. That's not a full time job because you just do it on Sunday morning, pick up people and bring them to church, but it's still needed in the church. So your gifting might not be full-time ministry, but you still have giftings in the church. And I just wanna say that there's a lot of people that take these personality tests and this and that to determine their gifting. Your gifting is solely rooted in the word of God and what God has spoken over your life. So quit looking at, well, this is my personality, so this is what I most likely am good at. Well, I don't care what you're good at. I care what God has ordained your life to be because it's in when you do that that you will actually find purpose and fulfillment. And you don't find that in some personality test. You find that in the Word of God. As you can tell, I feel very strongly about this today. Usually, I don't preach this message this hard, but just want you to realize we're not di- we're all equal in the sight of God and we all just do different things that's why it says are all apostles are all everybody has different things to do I might be teaching you the word of God and preaching messages but there's so much more things that go into the ministry there's things you don't see behind the scenes and counseling and praying and going and meeting with people and things of that nature and I can't do it all because I'm not everywhere all the time Though I spearhead this ministry, there are things that I have to have other people help with. You know, I'm not in Chicago right now. So when people need meetings and counselings or they need me to pray for somebody, I'll pray over the phone. But if you need somebody there physically, I have to have somebody else with that. So that's what we all work. We do different jobs and different roles, but we all work together. And unless everybody is doing their part, we'll never fulfill it fully. Now, there are diversities of gifts with the same spirit, diversities of administrations with the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. The manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues, but all these work at that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. What's the nine spiritual gifts? Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gift, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, kinds of tongues, interpretations of tongues. What's important? The gifts of the spirit are never meant to elevate a person into a position of preeminence in the church but are set in the body to profit with all, bear or bring together the entire body of Christ. Gifts are given by the will of God. Gifts are used to bring people together. So many people, well, I got this gift and I am this. And what you do is you separate yourself from others to try to elevate. Well, I have this gift, so I should be 
acknowledged in a place of prominence. Well, you're also of the devil and you'll probably go to hell. How about that? It's not about elevating yourself. It's not about having some position of preeminence. No, it's about all of us coming together as one. This passage comes before the passage we just read about the other offices in the body. So this is not about us separating ourselves. Because so many people, well, I have this position and I have a title that I, I'm above. No, stop that. The pastor is not greater than the lay person. The pastor's not better than the guy that's helping park cars or take the trash out or stack the chairs or drive the bus. We're all equal in the sight of God. My job is to serve you as you serve others, as we all serve people. It's about taking care of others. It's the will of God to bear or bring together, to profit with all, both in the church meaning the whole church comes together, and then also other people outside into the faith. The gifts of the Spirit are used to bring non-believers to make them believers, and it's to make believers come closer and closer together. When I'm in a room with somebody that I know does a better job at it than me, I let them do the job. If I'm in a room... And it comes to ministering healing, and we're both saying, I can minister healing, but if I know that you are way better at it, then I'm going to let you do it. You know, if it, if we're if we need to cook food for people, and I know you're a chef and I'm not, I'm not going to do it because I, I have to do it. I'm the one that needs the recognition. You do it. And you ready? I won't take your credit. We'll give honor to you for doing the work. It's not about being better than other people or having positions over others. The gifts of God are used to bring us all together, realizing I need you, you need me, and we work together. Whether you do it full-time or not, doesn't matter. God bless this word in Jesus' name. I'm just, I want you to get this. It's so important. Quit using them as titles. Quit trying to be better than other people. Just realize we all work together to do the will of God. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in their daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. And this saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Porchus, and Nacorm, and Teman, and Barmius, Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, Lord bless their names, whom they set before the apostles. When they had prayed, they laid their hands on the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, let's talk about this. What do we learn? Apostles declared that even the waiting of the tables required men that were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom and honest report. So doing the work of God requires the Holy Ghost in power. And it, the door holder needs to be the needs to be able to lay their hands and raise the dead, just like the pastor. The dude at the door should be able to speak a word of knowledge as easily as the pastor. So in serving and working all of the aspects of the ministry, you have to have Holy Ghost and power. Number one. Now, what's the difference? The fivefold is dedicated to prayer and ministry of the word. Now, Mark 9, 41, the ministries of services are as important as the ministries of the word. Just because I minister the word and you do something else doesn't make, no, we all need it. You ready? They were happy. There are so many people, if I said, we need door holders, I, just, I don't want to do that because that's not no good position. It says when the when the apostles looked and said, we need people to do this. 
and I'm, we're going to give this to you. This is now your responsibility. You know, so many times we have positions and in, in, in offices and ministries that need to be done in the church as a leader and a, and a guide of a flock as a pastor, I will give that responsibility. You're, you're fully responsible for it. You take, you don't have to come to me every time we need an answer. This is your responsibility. Now it said it pleased those men, which means it became not only something that they were doing, it became their full responsibility. They were happy to take it on and to steward it. Like it was given of God because you ready. It was given of God. They laid their hands on him and prayed. This was an impartation of God to serve in this way, to wait to, to feed people was an impartation of God. And guess what? They were happy about it. How many people in the church, if I said, hey, we need people to pass out food, would do it begrudgingly because you think it makes you less than? These people realized if God needs it done, I serve as unto the Lord, not as unto people. So if God needs this done, I will do this for God and God will be blessed. And you ready? Guess what happened? The word of God in People got saved. These people got saved not because the apostles were preaching. These people got saved because you had seven men waiting tables. This is important. We might have different roles, but your role is so important. And if you do it as unto the Lord, we will see people get born again. For the advancement of the gospel in Jesus' name. Stephen. Full of faith and power to great wonders and miracles among the people, there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertarians and Cretans and Alexandrians and them as Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they stubborn men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders, scribes, and came upon him, caught him, brought him unto the council, set up false witness, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and law. For we have heard him say this, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him. And when they saw his face, it had been the face of an angel. Now let's just make something very clear. What's the dark side of miracles? Not everyone will receive ministry to the point they might bribe, give false witnesses. They're going to do it to kill you to stop. You. You're operating in that much power. The devil will try to kill you, try to stop you. Why is it important? Not be offended, not have unforgiveness against people, but to be offered for God or to be offended at God for the things to try to stop you. A lot of people that God gives them a gift, God gives them this thing, and they think it's going to elevate them for position and status and prominence. And the next thing you know, all you do is get persecuted. They try to kill you over it. And people, you get offended at people. You get offended at God. And you walk, well, if it's like this, I'm not going to do it. Well, guess what? It's going to be like that. If you stand for the God, if you stand for God, the devil's going to hate you. Just make a decision to be okay with it. And when we say be okay with it, we mean love people despite what they do to you. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor striker, nor greedy, a filthy liqueur, but patient, not a brawler, not covenant. One that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest he be lifted up in pride and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be great, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy liqueur, having or holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. 
For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves good decree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. What are the requirements of a bishop? Blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, greedy of filthy the cure, patient, not a brawler, not covenants, rulers of his own house, children in subjection with all gravity, not a novice, not being lifted up in pride of good report. Just as a slight note, when it says husband of one wife, it's because back then there was a lot of um, polygamy, meaning guys had two, three, four wives. It's saying one wife. You're only supposed to have one. You're not supposed to have two or three. Requirements of a deacon, not double tongue, not given a wine, not greedy of filthy liqueur, holds the mystery of faith in a pure conscience, found blameless. Their wives also are grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. One wife, ruler over the children and the house well. What is the overarching premise of a bishop and a deacon? The ministries of the churches need men and women who are mature in the Lord. To establish the church so that they will not be reproached for fault or sin. That's the overarching premise. Mature people that don't live in sin so that way the church doesn't get a bad name. Super simple. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourself. For charity shall cover the multitude of sin. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified in Christ Jesus, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Why is it important to remember the gifts of God? Use him in love. They're supposed to be used in love. We must always remember that we are stewarding the grace of God and it so must be done in love so that God would be glorified. If God gives you something, you're supposed to use it in love. Anything outside of will not bring glory to God, but damnation to yourself and reproach to the church. We do it in love. Now there were in the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, which called Niger, uh, Lysias the Cretan, Mani, which has been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were in Salmas, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. What do we learn? That the ministry's gifts are also positions, but the fivefold working in the church at the same time. The ministries help equip each other. Prophets help teachers. Teachers help pastors. Pastors help apostles. I mean, they all work together. You can have all five in one church, but they all work together. What do we learn about Paul? Before Paul was the apostle Paul, he was an Antioch as a prophet or a teacher. Most apostles go through a teaching ministry. There's a lot of teaching that goes forth, which grows people and establishes people, brings them into their calling, which eventually turns you to an apostle because you start planting churches for the people you've taught how to walk in purpose, which is a lot of what we do right now. But a lot of times you'll progress in gifts. God starts you in one. Are you faithful in that? Then gives you increase and you get a greater gift. How do you steward that? Increase the... So you progress in things as you are faithful in what God has done in your life. The Spirit of God decides who's called into ministry. God is the one who equips into ministries or giftings. We must never misuse the gifts or calling as gods as titles. It's the Spirit who decides. God play. You don't wake up one day and say, well, I'm just going to be a pastor today. And then you make it. No. Positions in the church, offices and ministry are given by God, God alone. I know a lot of people that come, well, I'm supposed to be a prophet. Do you prophesy? No. Okay, well, then you're not. You're trying to say you are, and that exposes your heart that you're trying to use it as a title. Let me just say very clearly, you're of the devil. People that actually are will never say they are. It's a very important point. People... People that say, people that operate as prophets and things of that nature, they don't call themselves prophets. They just prophesy, and those things come to pass. Other people will say it about them, but they won't say it about themselves because they realize 
It's not about being somebody. It's about serving God, and serving people. I know I'm being very stern today, but this is such a important lesson before we move any farther into divine purpose to get you on the same page. Quit looking at yourself. Cry. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and is able also to bridle the whole body. What do we learn about the gifts of God? A person with a ministry calling will receive a greater condemnation. You are more responsible in the greater position that you have. And you're not supposed to go after it. You're like, well, I want to be this. Well, I would probably encourage you not to want that and not to desire and go after it because you actually are having a greater judgment of God the more responsibility you have. You're responsible for more. You will face a greater judgment for that. But what do we learn about offenses? A perfect man is one that does not offend in word, meaning that you're able to bridle your tongue. You either speak the word or you don't speak at all. Our opinion doesn't matter. That's what makes you perfect, is the ability to be able to only declare what God says. Now, if people get offended at the word of God, then they're offended at Jesus. They're not offended at you. But if you, as a minister in the church, start to give your own opinion, we see this a lot. This is the stuff that goes viral online. Videos of pastors saying things in the church is their opinion. Your opinion doesn't matter. The only opinion that matters is the word of God. So quit declaring, well, I believe this. Who cares what you believe? What matters is what God says. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many as one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another, having the gift differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the preparation of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he, or he that teaches teaching, or he that exhorteth exhortation, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. What does it mean to live sacrificially? You are living the bare minimum. It is reasonable to live sacrificially. He let Jesus live sacrificially. We live sacrificially. It is the bare minimum. There is no great thing to live sacrificially. There, man, I did this. It was such a big sacrifice. Okay. That's reasonable. That's the bare minimum. What do we learn about the body of Christ here? Not everyone has the same gifts or callings. We need to, we need each other to complete the entire will of God. We are to live and be responsible for what God has put in our life and not for someone else. Our responsibility is what God has placed in our own life, not what God places in somebody else. You have to do your part. I have to do my part. And as we do our own parts, the will of God will come to fullness need to remember that they're not titles they're offices they're things that need to be done and most of the time big misunderstanding because you see the big church well they just they have so much prominence you don't realize the opposition that you will face from the enemy because you're gonna you're gonna face a greater opposition you're also gonna have a greater condemnation of god so and a greater judgment of god there is way more responsibility it's not about having some title it's about serving, taking care of uh, you being more important than me. And when you are more important than me, that's when you will really start to enter into all of the things of God. We're going to stop here for today. Father, bless these people. In Jesus' name, I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Class, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you next week.